welcome back to my channel thank you so much for joining me i'm back i am back in the sunny us of a which is boiling tonight um what is the temperature 71 degrees so it's um i'm doing this later it is 1837 on the 5th of november so I've obviously got the election on tonight, um, which I, I can't really see it, but I can kind of see it in the background. Um, but yeah, so I am back finally. Um, it was a process, I'm going to tell you. It was not a nice experience. Uh, I am really late. Um, I was supposed to be back on the 18th of October and I got massively de delayed to the 30th of October because um, they refused my visa. But anyway, I just wanted to come on here. Um, there is no stitching, guys. I have I didn't take any stitching with me because I was supposed to be going around loads and loads of different friends, which I did, and I'll put like a montage of my visits um, at the end of this video. Um, but I just wanted to put a disclaimer up that there is no stitching. <laughs> um, I genuinely, like I said, I thought it was gonna be really busy, so I didn't take any with me. And I really honestly didn't think that the consulate was going to be as a big a ball ache as it was. Um, so I thought I was going to be in and out, done and dusted, passport back, out by the 18th. And then I'd have from the 18th all the way to the end of the month to do some stitching. Um, I didn't. Um, but, you know, hindsight, realistically, I should have taken some. So it is, like I said, it's um, just past half past six in the evening. I've been helping my friends with... Um, a ramp we made a ramp for her she's got two goats and three sheep I think and um, I think the weather's supposed to be really rubbish in Georgia for the next couple of days so she's got like a little barn for her um, mini farm um, but it's about two foot off the ground and her sheep find it really difficult getting up because they're quite big and heavy so today we made a ramp for her um, and I literally just got back so I had to get have a did my horses had a shower um, my hair isn't even dry my hair is still soaking wet I've got no makeup on I look a state um, but I've had loads of people that have been um, you know, messaging me saying, you know, it's, it's the fifth, come on, where's your update? We're waiting, <laughs> we're waiting. No, you're not going out, mate. You're staying in now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I thought, do you know what? I know I look a mess, but let's just, let's just do it. It's, to be, it's been crazy. So, I am just going to talk you through my <laughs> experience and what happened. Um... And then like what's happened in the last couple of days and like I said, end with like a montage of, you know, what I saw and I saw friends and went to visit places and it was, it was nice, but it was stressful. So, um, also the concrete was supposed to be done in my barn whilst I was away. So I went on the, oh my God, when I, get, I went on the seconds, which I don't even know what day that is now, Wednesday. And I think the concrete guys were supposed to come in on the 4th. Yeah, 4th of October, and they did. So I'll talk more about that um, in a second. So basically, my embassy appointment was on the 10th of October, and literally the officer ripped me a new arsehole. And I know that sounds really awful for me to say, I'm so sorry, it's like a really crude analogy. But most people are in and out within like three or four minutes. And um, I don't know, he had some kind of bee in his bonnet about me. Um, maybe he just was having a really bad day. The two people before me got denied. Um, it's really, really odd setup. So you kind of, you have to, you obviously have your DL160, which is your visa appointment. And then you go in and then you have to scroll on your phone. You're allowed your phone, but you have to scroll on your phone to make sure that it's not stuck. So if your phone scrolls, then obviously there's no bomb in it. <laughs> it's really bizarre. So then you go through security and then you go through the side and then you go to reception and they say, oh, um, what are you here for? And you're like, okay, here's my uh, appointment, yada, yada, yada. Then you go upstairs and then you go to, um, I had a special, because I, I was an E2 visa, not a B1 or whatever. So there's different d departments and areas that do different visas. So I went round um, to the, the place I was supposed to go and there was no one there. So there's like basically two like pods in front of me like square pods and you go it's almost like you go into like a room pod and then you've got a piece of glass and then on the other side you've got your con your US consulate so um I went in 
I sat down and then some guy on the left, so there's left and right, said, oh, next. So I kind of went in and he was like, oh, um, what are you here for? And I said, oh, E2 visa. And he said, oh, I don't really normally do those, but let me have a look. So he took my paperwork and then he brought it all up on the system. And he started start asking me questions about my business. He asked me like, um, you know, it was such a bloody blur, honestly. It was just, it was a horrendous time. Um, like what I'm, um, what my business name is, what we do, um, how much has been invested. He wanted to know what I do in the business. He wanted to know why I decided to put the business there, this, that, and the other. Um, and meanwhile, like he's going through stuff, um, and like looking at bits and bobs and he said like, well, how much are you, have you invested? I don't know if I told you that, uh, how much are you expected to make in the first year? Yada, yada. And then he was like reading stuff and then he's clicking through other screens and he stops and then he's just like, hmm. So then he said, just bear with me one moment. He toddles off. So you can see the whole office at the back. You know, it's all like open. Goes into a room. He's there. Wow. It must have been there 30 seconds, but it felt like five minutes. And I thought, oh no, what's happened? Is, is, is there something that's dodged on my visa, uh, on my passport? Or has something flagged up that I didn't know about? Like, I mean, have I done, have I been done for drug smuggling? <laughs> Something that I know nothing about. Like, what have they got on me that I don't know about? So, um, anyway, after what felt like a lifetime, I then came back and he was like, I'm really sorry, I, I can no longer help you. So I was like, right, okay. So he said, you just need to sit outside and then you need to wait for the guy next door. He'll be back shortly. So I was like, right, okay. So there was two other people sat outside as well. So I went and sat outside and then the guy said next and then and the thing is it's, it's so impersonal because you can hear everything that's been said and it's just like oh my god so one guy went in because I don't know that he got like a, a well I don't even know I don't, I, do, I don't even know because I just heard the word denied you've been denied um we're not so he said um, unfortunately I can't offer you a visa at this time um, and I think he asked like what his business was and how much, how many, um, how many staff he had and what he'd invested in this that, and the other. And then he was like, I'm really sorry. He didn't actually ask him anything. He literally got three questions and that was it. And then he was like, I'm really sorry. Uh, we can't offer you a visa at this time. So, and the guy was like, well, um, my, everything is over there. Can I appeal? And he's like, it's no, there's no appeal. Like there's no appeal. Um, so I don't know what happened to him. Um, you know, when a lot of people have their businesses already up and running and then they go home to get their visa because you have to be out of the USA and for your first visa, you've got to be out of the USA and you have to get your visa from your uh, country of uh, citizenship. Um, so anyway, the next one went up and again, didn't really ask him many questions, went into a little bit more depth with him, um, wanted to know um, what, how much family he had over there, whether he had family in his own country, how often he visits his own country. And then um, he was like, mm, mm hmm, mm hmm. And then he was like, right, well, unfortunately, this time I can't, um, I can't approve your visa. I'm just thinking, you know, when you're thinking, oh my God, like literally, oh my God. So before I'd even got in there, I was shitting my pants. So then um, it was like, so he went off. He was obviously really upset. God, honestly, you just feel for these people. And then I went in and he was like hi um what's your name um what what um what's your business and he's like scrolling through the system like trying to find information and he's like looking at stuff and then asking me questions about stuff and then looking at stuff and asking me questions so he's like so uh, why did you decide to put your business there um what, what have you got any have you got anything around you that is related to your business um how much have you invested where did the investment come from how many staff have you got um are they part-time are they full-time how long they work there for um he asked me um how much i'm expected to make in the first year is my barn already built um like literally but all this time he's kind of going and i'm you know what i'm sat there thinking do you know what this guy's got absolutely cool idea about my business like he has absolutely no idea about my application. He's got no idea about what he's talking about, about the person he's got in front of him. And he's making a snap decision about whether that person can literally, um, whether that person's whole, he's got his, that person's whole entire future in his hands. And um, to be honest, it made me really angry. 
um, that I was like, okay, so I'm not being funny, but you know nothing about my business. Surely before you interviewed me, you should have done some time of due diligence and gone through my application, had to look at my business plan. You don't know anything about the business, nothing. And it just like angered me because like I said, they're making decisions on people's whole entire future and they haven't even taken it seriously. They're not even looking at, they, you know, they're not even getting prepared. So anyway, um, and then he said, then he went to another screen and he was like, so when you went out to the States in 2016, how long were you there for? And I was like, two weeks. I was like, okay, so when did you arrive? And I said, I arrived, um, I think it was like the 30th of October or 29th of October. And he said, okay, and when did you leave? And I said, I don't know, about two weeks after that, whatever date that is. And he said, have you got any proof of that? And I was like, what? Um, no, I said, he said, like, just if you've got a picture of anything on your phone. And I said, no, this is 2016. This is like almost eight years, six years, well, however many years on we are. I said, I've had like two new phones since then. And obviously pictures, they don't, I don't transfer all my other pictures from all the other phones onto my phone. So I was like, no. And he said, OK, um, so I'm going to have to refuse your visa on the basis that I can't prove that you didn't overstay your visa. And I was just like, but I came home. And then he said, well, it doesn't look like that way on my system, because when you enter the USA, you enter and then the, the Custom and Border Protection do what's called an I-94. And it used to be a piece of paper that you got given. And now it's all... Um, electronic and I didn't even think to check it okay so what's it sh what it's showing is in 2016 I arrived in America and then 2022 I arrived in America and I said to him um so we said oh so when did you go back to America and I said in 2022 and I said since then I've had uh, a change of status and they would have done their due diligence to make sure that everything was kosher and everything was fine um and I said I I obviously had to have left to you know, had to have arrived again. You know, it's an impossibility for me to arrive somewhere twice without leaving first. And he said, yes, ma'am, I understand that. However, I can't prove that. And until we've got that as evidence, we can't issue your visa. So I was like, right, okay, so what do I have to do? So he said, he gave me a, a 221G, whatever it is, a form. And then he said, um, email this, um, send an email to this email address and your evidence that you actually left the country. So obviously, um, this was like on the 10th and I was like, okay. So obviously I walked away like pretty devastated if I'm honest. Um, cause obviously I didn't know what was going on and we were in London and mum and I decided, you know, as a celebratory, cause I, had, I didn't even see this coming. I thought it was going to be a walk in the park. Um, my, my immigration lawyer said I had a really, really strong application and the business plan was strong and it would be no problem be walking apart three questions bang yes thank you ma'am you're done out bye see you later here's your give me your passport oh that was the other thing he didn't keep my passport so because normally what they'll do is they'll keep your passport put your visa in it and then they'll send your passport back so he gave me all the documents back and I said don't can you do you not want to keep my, my passport and he was like nope <laughs> um he said they'll request it if they request it and I was like okay so I met my mum in like a cafe just outside of the embassy and then she's like, all sorted, all sorted. And I said, no, they refused my visa. And she was like, what do you mean? I said, well, he can't prove that I didn't leave the USA when I said I, I, lost, I left the USA. So my visa has been refused. And she was like, this is my mum all over. She's like, oh, OK, well, we haven't got time to deal with that right now. Um, we've got to get to the theatre because we had we were going to go see Moulin Rouge. And I tell you what, like, I, I kid you not, all I wanted to do is go to a pub and get pissed. <laughs> like, that's that way I was feeling. I literally just wanted to go to a pub and have a drink um, because I was just feeling really crappy. The last thing I wanted to do was go to a show. I didn't want to be around people. I was trying to get my immigration lawyer on the phone to find out, like, what happens now. Um, my mum kept was like, kept saying to me, get off the phone, get off the phone. You're always on your phone. Mom, mom. I was like, mum, I'm trying to get hold of my immigration lawyer. And she's like, well... My mum is very, she's not a very maternal person. She's like, well, basically, it's either going to get approved or it's going to be denied. And you just got to deal with it. There's nothing you can do about it. There's no point. There's no point in worrying about it because you can't change it. <laughs> That's what my mum's like all over. Um, so anyway, we ended up going to this Moulin Rouge thing. Um, uh, told my dad, obviously, what happened. And he was gutted. And he was like, you're joking. And I said, no. Uh, obviously, he was stuck here. So um, he said, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, I've just got to email my evidence over. So... Anyway, got home, 
Um, finally, so that was on the 10th. On the 11th, I emailed over my evidence. So I, I smashed them with everything I had. I did Facebook check-ins. I did bank statements showing transactions before I left the USA. Then obviously nothing whilst I'm in the US, just like standing orders and direct debits. And then, because um, I use my credit card when I'm over here. And then um, when I'm back, obviously then transactions 14 days later. Um, pictures of me picking my cats up from a cattery. I had the receipt from the cattery. I sent them pay slips. Um, what else did I send them? Like literally, I just smashed them with as much evidence as I could. Um, oh yeah, my flight showing that I approving. Not that. So a return flight is not proof that you left the country, you know. But it's obviously showing when I booked my flight, when I arrived, and and it says on there when I was supposed to have left. Um, I unfortunately, unlike my dad, who has fifteen years of boarding passes. Um, yes, my dad has got 15 years of boarding passes. So that's what he said to me. He was like, well, just just, um, just take a picture of your boarding pass. And I was like, what? Just take a picture of your boarding pass and send that to them. That's proof that you got on the plane. I'm like, dad, we're talking in 2016. And he's like, well, don't you keep your boarding passes? And I'm like, no, but I'm telling you what, I bloody will now. Um, so yeah, I mean, it just goes to show, doesn't it? How, it? Like how important evidence of being on and off a plane is. So Anyway, so on the 11th, I sent the evidence. On the 15th, I got an email back saying they requested more evidence. And then it just said, no, request for more information. And then it just underneath, it just said passport. So they wanted my passport. So at that point, obviously you haven't been approved at that point. But at that point, I was like, well, maybe they have then. Because why would they ask for my passport if they've not approved your visa? I mean, it's a complete waste of time, isn't it? So I kind of got a little bit happier. Um, I was actually with a couple of friends when I um, I got that email and I burst out into tears because I was like, oh, so upset. Um, like upset, happy, upset, you know, like as in like happy tears uh, and relieved. Um, and then on the 18th, um, so the 15th I sent the passport. On the 18th they received the passport, the day I was supposed to fly back, so I had to move my flight again. And then I ref I moved my flight to the Wednesday after that, um, thinking it was going to be a quick thing. Um, on the 21st, it took them forever to approve it. On the 21st, the consular officer approved it. Then it had to go through the consulate to approve it. Then it had to go to another approval co process just to make sure that you haven't been done for drug smuggling. You're not, you've not, um, you know, you're not paedophile. You've not been arrested. You're not on any watch list or anything like that, you know, that you are squeaky clean um, from a criminal perspective. Um, so then it went from the officer on the 23rd, the consulate then approved it. On the 24th, I got a notification that my passport was being sent back. And on the 28th, which is when I moved my flight to again, because I had to remove my flight again, I moved it for the 28th. Um, I received my passport back and then, um, or I had moved my flight till the 30th. Um, I got my flight on the 30th. So um, I flew back. And what is what's really interesting is that I don't know why, but in my head, I had a feeling that this was not going to be plain sailing. So when I, I left America, when I flew out of Atlanta, I was bawling. Like I had a, I had a, a window seat and I was like, literally, I didn't want to like talk to anyone or anything I was crying my eyes out because I didn't want to leave and I I just for some reason I just thought this is going to be a massive fight to get back and I don't know why or what made me think that but you know it, it's true isn't it and I just thought what happens if I come out of this country and then I can't get back like what happens if they deny my visa I mean that's a real possibility because you've got people that are making snap decisions <laughs> on your whole entire life having not even had a look at your bloody application beforehand which I obviously didn't know until the time. So, um, bawling, really, really emotional. Um, and then anyway, when we landed, um, I went, obviously you go through passport control and you know, it's just in the UK, it's just like you put your passport on the thing and like the doors open and bang, you just go out. My brother picked me up, which was nice. Um, he works in London, so he picked me up. So I spent a couple of days with my brother and my niece and his wife. Um, and then my mum came up on that Saturday, um, to basically pick me up and take me back to hers for a couple of days. Um, so we had the day with mum, 
And um, so my brother lives in Yately, but works in London. And Yately is like an hour and a half, could be like an hour and a half away from where he works. I mean, my, my brother's on the road at seven o'clock. Um, my brother's on the road at six o'clock in the morning to get to work. He doesn't leave until half past seven to beat the traffic. He doesn't then get home until about nine o'clock. And then from nine until 12 o'clock, he's looking at his emails. I mean, that, that, that boy works. Um, so then my mum picked me up on the Saturday. I went down to her, spent a couple of days with her. And then I went to my best friend's in Southampton, stayed with her for a night. Um, oh no, hang on, that happened before the consulate. Sorry, so that was before. So yeah, so when I arrived, when I arrived my brother picked me up. Um, and then my mum picked me up from my brothers and then I spent a couple of days with my friend Louise and then I flew back, flew back, I went back to mum's a day before we were going to London because we had to get like the 7am train um, then obviously did the consulate and everything and then after that um, I think I had a day at mum's and then I went um, to see all my friends around so I've got friends in Fairham, and, Fairham in um, Wickham, Bishop's Waltham um, all of that kind of area in Hampshire and then so I saw them and then how did I get up to oh then I got the train so yeah then I came back to mum's and because I didn't bother hiring a car because the the public transport in the UK is phenomenal so I literally was um being a, a um taking the bus I was gonna say bus bitch then that's what it is but um yeah it's a bit rude um taking the bus everywhere and then taking the train everywhere it was just a lot easier and then you know on the times that I had to be somewhere for some for a train mum just took me to Chichester train station so I went up to Gloucester which is where I did my degree so I've got a load of friends up there so I saw loads of friends up there and I've got like loads of pictures and um and then I came back um in the meantime um and then went to Chichester and saw friends this is like the day before I was supposed to leave yeah, day before I was supposed to leave. Um, went to see a friend for lunch. Went to Chichester to the cathedral, which was absolutely beautiful. Um, and there was like a massive orchestral orchestra in there. They were, um, what's the word? Uh, Practising for a massive like show they had that evening. And um, myself and Mark, the guy that I met for lunch, we just went in there and sat down and you could because they were, they were literally just practicing. We obviously didn't have tickets that night. They were sold out. And we just went and sat down. We, we actually sat through the whole entire show. <laughs> they were just practicing. So we got basically to see the whole thing free. And I'll tell you what, the, um, it was absolutely beautiful. You know, the sound is phenomenal and the acoustics in the cathedral is, was amazing. Um, so yeah, we spent a few hours in there and then we hit the high street and then hit the pub. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think once I knew that everything had been approved visa wise, I started to kind of like enjoy myself a little bit and calm down, but it was just so much of a waiting game. And, you know, having, after I sent like all the evidence, I, so I, I didn't really want to go up to Gloucester until I'd sent my passport. So what, then I was just waiting for my passport to come back. So I was like messaging friends and things and I was like have you got any spare time <laughs> I've got so much time on my hands I mean this is a sod's law isn't it that I then had so much time um, because all I was doing is waiting for my visa um, that I could have done so much stitching I mean there was there's countless amount of my um, stitching projects that I probably could have finished whilst I was over there but anyway so what I did is I dove um, I dove into oh, I can't do there. Garth Garfield, don't you knock my TV off, please. Um, I just dove, so I'm, I'm launching another business. I'm launching a, um, a horse apparel business, which is um, saddle pads, matching saddle pads with uh, ear bonnet, with uh, boots and bandages and that sort of thing. And we're going to go into like matching tops and jods and things like that. So I'm in talks with sort of the manufacturing companies. And, you know, it takes a lot. It takes a lot to to get the design right and to get the company that you feel comfortable a sending money to <laughs> um and you know seeing designs and things like that and it, it's a, it's time consuming so um I literally spent pretty much all my time on my phone and my mum was just like Holly you're always on your phone you're always on your phone I was like mum I'm working I literally had nothing else to do so I thought I'd just throw myself into work. My laptop was here um, for any orders for turmeric that needed to go out. Dad could then just print the label and box it all up and, and do it. So I left my laptop and everything here. So he had literally, he was running my business. My dad was running my business behind the scenes. 
So, um, going back to my barn, barn update, my the concrete guys arrived on, so I, I left here on the 2nd and I can't even remember what the day it was. So I think it was a Wednesday and on the Friday the concrete guys were supposed to come in. And we decided, so my original plan was I wanted concrete pavers and my builder, oops, my builder said that um, they're really, they're going to be expensive and time consuming and you know this, that and the other. So then we kind of came to a compromise and he said, why don't you have concrete stamping? So we decided to go for like a herringbone stamp. So the guys came out and uh, I was in the middle of getting a train um, to Southampton. And my dad phones me up and he said, Holly, um, they've done the concrete stampings. They did one lot. Okay, so they did the tack shop and the feed, tack shop. They did the tack room and the feed room. And then they moved on to the aisle and for one, they bought the wrong stamp. They did block work and I didn't really want block work. I wanted the herringbone because it just breaks it up a little bit. And then in, they were out by four inches. So you had this, it looked perfect. And then this lot was out by like four inches. So um, he, my dad was like beside himself because he just said to, I mean, he just said to Braxton and they were both like, oh, I can't believe this. Holly is not going to accept this. She's not, she's like proper OCD, attention to detail, mental. Like she's not going to go for this. Um, and they were like, well, we don't know what to do. So I spoke to Braxton, who was my builder. He wasn't the guy that did it. Um, and then I said, okay, um, you know, he apologised and couldn't believe it, couldn't believe, like, the shoddiness of the work. And then I spoke to Dad and I said, right, well, you know, um, at the end of the day, they're going to have to smash it out and do it again. And he's like, well, we can't really smash it out and do it again because it's, you know, it's a lot of work and it's going to be expense. And I said, yeah, they're expense. I said, I, um, he said, well, you know, you're not going to see it with the wall because um, you'll have a wall, so you won't actually see the two together. And I said to him, do you know what? I am so sick to death of just accepting people's crappy work because they obviously are substandard or they clearly can't do it or they say they can do something they can't and I'm always the one that ends up having to pay for it and have to accept crappy work. So I said to my dad, um, leave it with me and I phoned up Reed. Uh, and at this point, he hadn't seen it, mind. So Reed was the owner of the of the concrete company, and then he had um, a contractor. And this is the other thing that really annoyed me. I was talking to Reed and his associate, assuming that they were actually going to do the work, not realizing that they were just going to subcontract it out, out some contract it out to someone else. So, um, I got Reed on the phone, and I was like, "Hi, Reed, how you doing?" He's like, um, "Hey, uh, they in the south they go, hey, Miss Harley." <laughs> Hey, Miss Harley. Um, he was like, hey, Miss Harley. Um, I said, so what's going on then? I said, uh, what's going on with the concrete? And he said, well, um, they're a little bit out, you know, um, of, you know, um, like line or whatever, alignment. And I was like, yeah, I heard. I said, I've just been on the phone to dad. And I said, so um, what are we going to do about it? And he was like, well, ma'am, I'm going to level with you. I can't afford to fix it. <laughs> And I was like, well, sir, I'm going to level with you. You're not going to get a dime out of me unless you fix it and it's done properly because I'm so done with having to pay for shoddy work from people that I'm not doing it anymore. Um, gone were the days where I paid people before the work was done and gone were the days uh, where I, I, you know, pay um, upfront for something or, you know, 50% of something, blah, blah. You know, I don't mind if I'm paying um, for materials and things like that, but... Anyway, so I said, you've got two choices. I said, you either, it either gets smashed out and you do it again, or you just bugger off and I'll just get someone else to do it. Like, just go off site, do something else, go. And um, he was like, oh, okay, um, I'm on the way to go and have a look anyway. And I was like, right, okay. And dad said that when he arrived, he had to look at it and he literally hung his head down. He had no idea how bad it was. So when he was telling to, telling me that like he wasn't going to fix it, he had no idea exactly how bad it was. So um, they came to an agreement that 
the um, the bit of the side of the tack, the tack room and the feed room could stay and then they would smash out all the other bits. Now the problem is with the other bit, um, the tack room and feed room is I've got a toilet in the tack room, I've got a sink in the tack room and I've got a sink in the feed room. So it's got all the piping. So anyway, I had, I had a look at, um, I didn't even, so I arrived on the 30th and then I had to look at the work on the next day and you know when you're like, I don't even want to go and have a look because I know that I'm going to see things that I'm going to hate. I'm going to see that there's like mistakes and I'm not going to be able to deal with it. Um, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not a perfectionist, but I just like something to be done well, uh, you know, to a, a decent, a semi-decent standard. So anyway, I got there and I could not believe what I saw. So halfway down, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, halfway down that area, the tack room, I don't know how he's done it, but he's twisted the pattern so instead of the, the instead of, um, you know, the brickwork being like this, you know, pattern where it's like, you know, you've got half and half, um, it's like this all the way, all along one, one whole way through the middle of my tack room. And then I had a look to see where my wall was going and yeah, my wall is not going to cover that. So I thought, okay, well, my, I might be able to cover it. It really bloody annoyed me that it was done like that. So then I spoke to dad and I said, have you seen, have you seen this? And he said, yeah, I have. He said, to be honest, neither me or Braxton even noticed it when it was done. And I was like, right, um, well, that needs to come out as well. And he was just like, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I, I think dad said to me that I set... Um, Reed's expectations of what was expected before he'd even turned up on site so there wasn't a fight about him having to kind of you know fix it so Braxton smashed out all the concrete the first lot the other lot is still there at the moment so uh, on a very long deep conversation with dad um, we've decided that we just we can't we can't take the risk that the patterned concrete is and it actually looks shit it honestly i thought it was going to look nice but it really doesn't there's no different definition it's just gray it's horrible and it just it doesn't have that wow factor that i'm going for so um i said to dad like you know what i'm gonna love with you i really want to go back to pavias and he said to me do you know what holes i think that's going to be the safest option it might cost a little bit of money because it's more laborious but, you know, the great thing about paviers, if, if someone knocks over a hoof oil and it goes all over the floor, I mean, if I wanted to be really anal about it, I could just literally just take up those paviers and replace them. Um, the problem you've got with the concrete is that, I mean, and, and Braxton already did say, because one of my biggest concerns was I didn't want it cracking. And he was like, well, we'll put expansion joints in it. However, you're always going to get micro fractures. He's like, you're just going to have to deal with it because it's just going to happen. And I, gosh, I, I was like, oh, it's just going to look so crap and you can't fix it. You know, you can't fix crack in concrete. If a, if a pavia cracks and breaks, you can just whip it out and you can just put a new one in there. So um, I just really wasn't feeling, I wasn't feeling comfortable with the whole kind of doing that concrete so uh now what we've decided is obviously where the stables are going that's that was the only bit that wasn't patterned concrete Ooh. so we're doing so we're going to get reeds because apparently he's done another pad and it looks really good so you know what dad said you've got to give him the opportunity to put it right which is fine i understand that um but the 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 concrete pay the concrete pattern the pattern concrete is just too much of a risk that they get it wrong because he can't smash it all out again I mean how many times is this guy going to smash the concrete out you know is concrete's expensive so we've got a massive load of concrete sat out by the barn and I said to dad like what are we going to do with that and he said well Braxton's already decided he's going to get a um, concrete crusher and then we're going to use it for crush and run and use it for our road so it's not going to be wasted so that's good but what a bloody palaver so with everything else that was going on at home, then I had that to deal with. Um, and then I came back on the 30th, um, had a couple of days with dad, which was nice. 
um, I was so jet lagged. I was so jet lagged when I went to the UK. Um, but then when I came back here, I was just so tired, like all the time tired. It took me uh, about two weeks to get over, like not feeling absolutely knackered in the UK, because obviously the UK is five hours ahead of us. So anyway, got back and then obviously jet lagged the other side. So I had a, a night flight over to the UK. Um, no, hang on. Yes, you always do night over to the UK and day coming over here because they're five hours behind. So then I had a day flight back over here. And um, yeah, it's just because you're five hours behind, you have to stay up another five hours, don't you? But I was so tired. I went to bed, it must have been like nine o'clock and I slept until seven o'clock eight o'clock something like that and bless him my dad he didn't even wake me up um he just carried on doing the horses in fact the whole pretty much apart from a couple a couple of days the whole time he was just like do you know what just catch up on sleep don't worry about the horses I'll sort them out and then he was just potting around doing whatever he wanted so um I took him back on the fourth so his flight was like six thirty. so at two o'clock we left here to go to the airport um, dropped him off that was very uneventful and then I got onto the I-20 and I was five minutes down the I-20 and I was hearing this sound that sounded like my exhaust was going and I was just like what the hell is that noise and I was listening to Classic FM because <laughs> I'm sad um, but don't knock it Classic FM is lovely when you just want a bit of like chill time it's um it's a British station and it's all classical music and I actually just sometimes I just love it so it's an app on my phone, it goes through my radio, and I thought like, what is that noise? So I turned the radio down, and then it was still there, and I thought, that's weird. But then it was getting progressively louder and louder and louder. And I was just like, what is that? Anyway, suddenly the car went, dum 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 and I was just, oh no, I think I've got a flat tyre. Well, I pulled over, onto the hard shoulder, but there was a lot of construction work going on. So I pulled over past the, the hard shoulder, a little bit more over to where the construction was going on. And then I phoned my mate and I was just like, because me, I go into panic mode before my brain engages. So I panic first and then brain engages. So I phoned her and I was like, what do I do? I said like, I've got a flat tire. I can't, I can't change flat tires. I'm a proper girl, can't do any of that. So she was like, have you got a spare? And I was like, I am got no idea. <laughs> She's like, well, have a look in the back of your car, see if you've got um, a spare. Now, I've got a Nissan Xterra, like a big 4x4 four four thing, so I wasn't getting the bloody wheel off anyway. And um, I had to look in the back of the car, nothing. And she said, oh, you've got a 4x4, four four, it might be under the car. And I was like, what the bloody hell is a wheel doing under the car? Well, that's where my wheel was, it was under the car. Um, but I've got this, um, I don't know what it is, this kind of whole kind of, I don't know, this a metal contraption at the back of my car and before I got it someone had obviously hit the back of the car and smashed it into the back um, and it is up against the wheel so I phoned so Tracy my friend arrived um, and she was just like mmm don't think we're gonna be able to get that wheel out somehow and also with those particular cars you need this big rod thing especially with um, wheels underneath cars I needed this like massive rod thing that went in and like undid it so the wheel drops down but it wasn't obviously going to drop down. A, I didn't have that weird contraption that I needed, clearly. Um, so I phoned State Farm and they said, right, we're going to send someone out to change the wheel for you. Um, one guy pulled up who was like an emergency, this wasn't anything to do with State Farm, to an emergency guy. And he was like, oh, you know, I feel so sorry for you being here. Bear in mind I was there on my own, Tracy hadn't arrived by then. Um, I do emergency, I do emergency call outs. Um, and I was like, all right. And he was like, what's the problem? And I said, I just need my tire change. I just need this one going on there. And he was like, all right. He was like, well, you know, um, I feel so sorry for you. So I'm going to try and help you as much as I can. I can change your tire for $900. And I was like, $900 to change a tire. Are you for real? And then he was like, well, you know, that, I mean, look at, look at, I mean, I'm an emergency guy, so look at these invoices, and some of these invoices are over $1,500 to $2,000, and I'm like, yeah, you clearly take the piss out of people that are stranded. So I kind of completely lost all respect for him after that. And then he was like, well, I can do it for $700. And then I was like, no, I'm not paying $700 to, to bloody get a tyre changed. 
And then he's like, yeah, but, you know, you need the contraption that, you know, to undo the tyre. And I've got that here. And I was like, can't I just use that to just undo the tie and he was like no ma'am I'm afraid not you know um my insurance won't cover that and I'm like do you know what in my head I'm like you're just an idiot and then he was like well I'll do it for like 200 300 dollars and then he said all you have to do is you have to give your receipt into State Farm I don't know what's going on, on my tv um and they'll they'll reimburse you and I was like State Farm aren't gonna give me 300 dollars to change a tire I said uh, I'll phone them and find out how much they will give me. So anyway, I phoned them and they give you like 120 bucks towards changing a tyre and then anything after that I've got to pay for. So I was like, do you know what? Forget it. I've got, at this point, you know, State Farm had already con contacted someone to come out. What a waste of time he was. He took an hour and a half to get there. He, he rocked up in a car and he had literally nothing on him. So in the UK, our, our breakdown people, RAC and AAA, no, AA, AA, AAA, I think is U US. They are in a massive van and they've got every single contraption that they could possibly do and use and they can do anything engine wise and change, um, they can change like tires and everything. They've got everything they need. This guy rocked up stinking a weed. And, um, and I was just like, kind of looked at him and was like, can you even change a tire? And he was like, well, not really. And I was like, right, okay. Probably not not much use to be in here then, to be honest, because I've got a puncture and I need my tyre changed. So he was like, right, yeah, I'm really sorry, I can't help you. So I was like, okay, fine. <coughs> got back on the phone to State Farm and uh, said to him, right, that guy was useless. <laughs> so I said, can you just tow me to a garage and then I can just get a tyre changed? Yeah, we can do that. So... Sorted out, this was at four, the, okay, so I'd been there since four o'clock. At this point, it was like six. Tracy had turned up, and um, so I obviously had my blinkers on because we are um, we're getting dark a little bit early. Not as early as, as England, mind, but we do get darker a little bit early. And um, so they said, so how, so it took forever for me to get an ETA. It must have been like half an hour, 40 minutes before I got an ETA. And then the ETA was like, we're going to be 120 minutes. So I was like, oh my gosh. So um, Tracy and I were just sat in the car together and um, Blink is going, just chatting, not really doing anything. And like 20 minutes after that, 120 minutes comes, I ring him back up and I'm like, where is this guy to tow the vehicle? And um, he was like, oh, he cancelled the job. <laughs> and I was like, okay, no one think of like sending, I said, so you obviously sent someone, someone in the replacement. No, ma'am, we're trying to find someone. And I was like, right, so it's been like 120 minutes plus 20 minutes plus like 45 minutes before you had even told me that the guy had gone uh, or left where he was leaving to come to me. And um, and you're saying that like you haven't even got anyone coming to me now. Um, no, ma'am, we're trying to find someone. And I was just like, oh, for the love of God. So another half an hour goes. And then they finally find someone and then ETA again, 120 minutes. And by this time it's like, well, nine o'clock. Um, so I was just like, right, well, uh, my horses hadn't been fed. The cats were out. Um, I had this whole evening planned. I was going to get home from um, the, um, I was going to get home from um, the airport. I was going to go via Publix and get some mint sauce because I'd made a, um, so I made, for for Dad, I made him a roast dinner. It was, it was a Saturday that it was flying. No, was it Sunday? No, so yeah. So I made him a roast dinner. <clears throat> so he actually had some decent food to fly with. And so, and I didn't eat, really eat much because I was so tired. I can't eat when I'm tired. So basically, I was going to go via Publix, get some mint sauce, because it doesn't matter what roast dinner I have. I have to have mint sauce on my roast potatoes. It's just a thing. Uh, and then obviously this happens and I was going to go home, do some stitching and like have a bottle of, not bottle, but sorry, that came out wrong. Um, oh, it's all out now, isn't it? Um, have a glass of wine, open a bottle of wine. I think that's where I was going. Um, have a glass of wine and um, yeah, didn't work out like that. So finally this guy rocks up at 11 o'clock and then they say that they can tell you 14 miles and any after, anything after that you've got to pay for. So I was like, right, please can you just tell me to like tyre south or whatever it is called up in Covington near me. Yeah, fine, 45 bucks, okay, pay it, I pay it. 
I get towed there, I do a, I leave a note and do a key drop. Phone him up the next morning, um, doing some phoning around saying, I actually had to look at one, the other tire and that was like really on the way out. So realistically I needed two tires. So I was like, right, okay, so I just basically need to um, look for some used tyres. I never really never really buy new tyres. In the UK, we always buy used tyres. They're big in the UK. So anyway, couldn't find anywhere here that does used tyres. Do you do used tyres? No, ma'am, we only do new. Do you do used tyres? No, we only do new. Right, okay, well, obviously not a thing. So I phoned up this other company, Mavis Tyre, I think it was, and I said, look, I've got an Xterra, 2008. What tyres do I need? Because at, at this point, I was like, right, I might as well just get new. Um, and they were open before the place that I dropped my car. So, um, he was like, right, you need this, blah, 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 two, four, seven, stroke, sixteens or whatever. So bought two of those, $247. Um, my friend had picked me up, my other friend, um, Lynn, who I was helping with the ramp today. She picked me up, took me to the tyre place. We took those tyres to the other place. They were going to charge me 55 bucks to put them on. Fine and dandy. Got them there. Tires are the wrong size. They're supposed to be 17s, not 16s. Okay, great. Have you got what I need here? And they're like, yeah, we do. Um, for two tires and fitting, it was $347. So I was like, right, okay. Take the other tires back. Um, get a refund on my credit card. But obviously, it takes one or two working days to go back on. Get back to the other place. Uh, obviously, because I was like I just basically landed them with my car and I, my car wasn't booked in I had to kind of fit in with everyone else so four o'clock comes finally my car gets I mean I literally was left there all day I finally get my car in um they change the tires um so it comes to paying and um 347 dollars it was so I was like oh, bloody hell so anyway give them a credit card go to the machine bang approved comes up on his system transaction cancelled okay um then I go through again um and I thought maybe it was because I need to put my pin in um in England you have a limit before you have to put your pin in you can't just tap like a thousand dollars it has to, I think it's now a hundred pounds I don't know um so I thought well it might be that so I don't know what's going on my tv I might have to reset my router I'm having a bit of a mental breakdown and um, so basically um, we put it through, put my pin in, went through again, approved, transaction cancelled. And I was like, are you sure this isn't going through? And he's like, no, because I've still got, he said that here, I've still got a balance. It's still showing as a balance on the system. It's not cleared it. So I was like, right, okay. So he said, well, maybe it's a terminal. So did it again. Um, and it came up with something completely different um but it still hadn't gone through so he was like okay we'll just try we'll just try one more time then he got this message up on his screen saying um refer to ar accounts receivable um unable to uh un unable to process the payment because there is a 758 dollar credit on the account that guy had maxed my credit card out so basically every single time that i put my card through even though he said it had gone through it went through and um, basically it went through four times. And also I'd paid for those other tires and had a refund, but the refund doesn't get hit. So I had $247 plus four times $347 go through my credit card. Um, and he proper maxed it out. So I was just like, what the bloody hell am I gonna do now? Because I'd actually paid off my credit cards before I came out. So I'd pretty much emptied my bank account. Um, because I live on my credit cards and then I pay them all off at the end of the month. So I was like, right, great, what do I do? <laughs> so he said, oh, I mean, to be honest, I haven't even checked today because it's just been mental. Um, he said, like, give it one or two days and it should go back on. So I'll, I'll check tomorrow. It's fine. But um, so anyway, I so just going back to the to when I um, I left there. Um, so I, I dropped got dropped off like half past 11. Then my friend obviously dropped me back here. And um, we did the horses together, which is really nice, even though she pays me to do a horse. <laughs> She's got three horses here. So we did that, and then I was looking for my cat for two hours. Like, the other two were in. Garfield was nowhere to be seen. So the other two came, um, one was in anyway, and then the other one came in, and then Garfield just disappeared, which is this bugger here, the one sat up here. 
calling him, calling him, making dinner, making a racket, can't get hold of him, don't know where he is, making this, I um, did this weird cat thing on my phone which normally brings all the cats running, nowhere, so I was like, what am I going to do? So, um, I have a bit of dinner, but I'm not, I'm really not feeling it because at this time I'm exhausted and it's, it's like almost one o'clock in the morning. Anyway, so I then um, hear him at the door, so I open the door and I was like, great, he's in. Right, I'm gonna go to bed. Went to bed, went to get into bed, put the light on, bloody cat had been sick on my cat on my bed. So I was just like, you know, and you're thinking just like what is going on with this? Can this day just end, please? <laughs> um, this is too much. So I ended up having to switch out my sheets at one o'clock in the morning, having to redo your sheets is not is not a thing you wanna do. Um and then I found out the next morning that my um, honestly, you couldn't write it. So, what happened? The, my hosting for my website and my email, which goes through the same thing, it was due up for renewal, up for renewal, and it literally went from $119 until like three times that amount. So I was querying it, and I was back and forth, back and forth querying it, and I was like, I don't, and they only do, apparently, they only do one um, one thing now, which is unlimited hosting, unlimited this, unlimited that, unlimited everything, and now they're like really expensive. And I said to him, like, I've got one website and I've got two emails. I said, I don't need unlimited. Like, this is a ridiculous amount of money for me to be paying on this. And then he was like, well, if you don't like it, then like you just go and get your host somewhere else. So it was like, okay, fine, I'll do that. Got off, so went to try and send an email. They cut my hosting, my website gone my email gone, bloody everything gone. So I was just like, right, okay, well, what am I gonna do now? So I was getting in contact with all of my techie friends and they said, if you wanna migrate it over, it's gotta be live. So in order for you to migrate your host, hosting and everything over to another host a company, hosting company, you, it's gotta be live. So he's like, you are gonna have to bite the bullet and pay for it to be reinstated. You know, you're like, oh God, really? So, and also I was in the middle of, um, so this, this bloody land dispute has come back up again. I've got another request of further evidence, um, a request of first refusal for that 18 acres that Loretta's trying to buy with some kind of insurance payout. Um, so, and, and he sent us the email. He was like, I, I did send, originally sent this to Cheryl, who's my lawyer, but she said that she's no longer representing you. Um, Oh, what'd she say? She said, yeah, she said she's no longer representing you and for you to, for us to just contact you direct. And I was like, hmm, this is news to me. So obviously I needed to get, luckily that came through on my hotmail.co.uk, which is my personal one, not my business one. My business was hosted through this company. So um, obviously I needed to contact Cheryl and um, I obviously couldn't do that. So just a nightmare so anyway I managed to then I just bit the bullet you know sometimes you've got to pick your battles and uh I just yeah I'm really I was really pissed off that they had done that because they basically had me over a barrel like I was stuck between a rock and a hard place that so, you know you can either continue on with your business or your business is basically defunct because we're just gonna <laughs> you're gonna vanish from from everything and I need my work email um so anyway, that was a bit of a nightmare. So I, I managed to kind of get it back up, cost me a bloody fortune. Um, <clears throat> and it was reinstated straight away. All my emails were there. Emailed Cheryl saying, I'm not really too sure what's going on. I got this um, request, um, the, uh, re re uh, re not request. I'm so used to say request for further evidence, RFE. It's R-O-F-R, um, first refusal, something, something first refusal. And, um, so I sent her an email saying, I'm not sure what's going on. Could you just confirm? Um, Travis has just sent us an email saying that he's, you're not representing us anymore. Um, I said, that's fine, but uh, can we make our relationship a little bit more formal? Because I'm not really sure what's going on. And then she came back to me and she was like, um, hey, Miss, Miss Harley. <laughs> Everyone calls that. Even my accountant's like, hey, Miss Harley. She's from New York, so she's got a real New York accent. Um, and, uh, and um, she came back and she said, uh, well, the reason I said I wasn't representing you is because it was um, what he gave me was something completely unrelated to what we'd been um, doing. So I wasn't representing you um, for what he had sent me. 
and he said due to the fact due to the fact that they they're only giving you 10 days I didn't want to respond on your behalf having not spoken to you um and then that time that time start ticking so I was like right okay not to worry um I said but can I have an appointment to see you so I'm seeing you on Thursday 4 30 so um it's all gone to shit again basically so I don't really know what's going on another stress um yeah I'm just so sick of it to be honest I'm absolutely knackered so the um the barn's kind of been put on hold for now my uh, builder is just working on another arena he should be finished on that Friday I think and then after that probably Monday we'll get the guys out and um we'll start working on the barn again um my hosting's up again and my um emails up again so that's fine but yeah it's just been a really crappy month I mean I've not earned any money um you know obviously I'm having to go back and forth with my clients saying to them like you know I'm really sorry I'm gonna have to postpone you and actually do you know what my clients are absolutely lovely they're like they all understand there's really nothing I can do about it I just I'm my life is in someone else's hands and they all understand that I didn't get any crappy comments back which is really nice they're like you know just make sure you come back to us which was really nice um so I'm just dealing with like you know booking everyone in now but um yeah, I'm so sorry that it's, this video seems so depressing and I really didn't want it to come across as depressing but it's just, literally this is just what's happened over the whole entire month and leading into, um, leading into, oh, oh, oops, something just fell off my desk, um, leading into November. So, like I said, I didn't get any stitching done. However, I do have my whip go still. Um, and I am planning on doing stitching. It's in the plan. So obviously October I need to do, and now I need to do November. Um, what's happened to that? Okay. So I've got 17 and 18, no, 17 and eight, which is, so, okay. So I'm now I'm going to talk about um plans so I'm, I'm gonna put in I'm gonna put in all the everything I did at home all the pictures and videos and everything and then now I'm gonna talk about plans Local time now is 11.47. For your continued comfort as well as your safety, remain seated with your seatbelt securely fastened about you until we've come to a complete stop at our assigned gate and the captain has turned off the fastened seatbelt sign. That'll be your indication that it's safe to get up, move about the cabin to collect your personal belongings. As we taxi to our gate, check the seat back pocket in front of you and your seating area to ensure you have collected everything that you brought on board. Exercise caution when opening overhead bins. Items have a tendency to shift during flight and landing. If you need assistance here with ground transportation, baggage claim, gate connecting flight information, uniform Delta representatives meeting the flight will be more than happy to assist. On behalf of this entire crew, it's been our pleasure bringing you here. Good day. Enjoy your stay. Welcome home. Beautiful peaches, sun, palm trees, beautiful turquoise water.
gorgeous silver sands. <laughs> Not in England. Seventeen and eight, sixteen and fourteen is what is coming up on Whipgo. So this month, oh well, oh, I say this month. I think I'm just going to have to put it down to this year. I will just get what I can get done because I've also got so much going on right now. I have got to do um, two squares in autumn jumble and Chinese flowers. Do you remember those uh, big um, hydrangea hydrangeas? I think they are, like the big hydrangeas. Um, I've got to do 500 stitches on that one. Um, no, sorry, I've got a thousand, got to do a thousand stitches on that one. I've got to do 500 stitches on Rise of the Witches, which is by Lisa Parker, which is a heaven and earth design. I've got to do 500 stitches on Enchanted Snowman, which I believe is a Donna Gelsinger one, which is a stocking. Um, 666 stitches on Peacock Love, which is a Josephine Wall um, design, and it's part of that bigger design, which was Peacock Days. Um, Grace Face 2, which is a Josephine Wall 
I've got to do 1014 stitches. This is like, this is my little book of what I need to do. So this is like all of the numbers and, um, and how many, I know you can't really read it. I've got really small writing. Um, and then I've put them into kind of some sort of order. So Grace Phase 2, I've got to do 1014 stitches. Um, Royal Games, which is um, a Mirabilia, is the card one. Do you remember? You know, you've got the two cards, the diamonds and queen and spade and club. Um, I've got to do 500 on that one. On Gobbler Farm, which is a Donna Gelsinger, I want to say it's Donna Gelsinger, by Heaven and Earth Design. Um, 500 stitches on that one. Crossword, which is a long dog sampler, I've got to do 500 stitches on that one. Henry VIII, which is by um, Hans Holbein, um, a Heaven and Earth Design, I've got to do 1,000 stitches on that one. The Flag, which is the... the um, Oh man, it's the Etsy one that the begins with V. Very oh, who's the design on that? V Vibsters, Vibster, Vibster. Um, I might have to do all this by memory. I've got to do five hundred stitches on that one. It's about time, which is Siren Siren Machete. I've got to do five hundred stitches on that one, and All Hallows Eve. <sighs> Is that Donna Gelsinger, All Hallows Eve? It might well be. I've got to do a thousand stitches on that one. So all in all, my stitch count that I've got to do to make up for missed month is 8,180 stitches plus the two squares for the autumn jumble, which um, I don't know how many, I guess that's a hundred each, isn't it? So it'll be about, well, I don't know, because it's, it's not all stitching, is it? Some of it is, um, you know, it's more samplery, so it's not all going to be um, full, full on stitches. So yeah, that's basically what I've got booked to do this month. And we are already the 5th of November. Oh, it's Guy Fawkes night. Remember the remember, the 5th of November. In England, we have um, bonfire night. And that comes from um, our tradition um, that, well, years ago, and I don't even know what the date was, and I'm really sorry about that. Sorry to disappoint. Um, disappoint you Brits I actually don't remember the date there was a gentleman called Guy Fawkes who wanted to and almost successfully blow up the Houses of Parliament and for those of you that don't know what the Houses of Parliament is that's where all of the House of Commons and House of Lords are um, that's where our government is in the um, in, in London in, in Westminster so you know Big Ben you know like the big on the Thames and you've got Big Ben that's Houses of Parliament and that's where our government, that's where all their cabinets are. So, um, I, I don't know how, but somehow we got tipped off. Um, or someone tipped someone off. And Guy Fawkes, it was unsuccessful. He's put, he basically put in a load of dynamite <laughs> under the um, Houses of Parliament to blow it all up. So, tradition in the UK is now, we have a... Uh, um, a bonfire night and I think it's because he was burned at the stake I think that's how they they executed him so obviously uh, England's gone mental with bonfires and fire fireworks and you know you can go to like really nice firework displays and they have um what do you call it um mulled wine and cider and candy floss and um you know hot dogs and that sort of thing and it's in England, it's normally November, by the 5th of November, you're cold, you've got your coat on, you've got your scarf on, and it's, you know, it's chilly, very cold. Um, so to be in, you know, in that environment with all the fireworks and the bonfire, and it's really, really nice, it's lovely, it's really cosy. Toffee apples and all that. So yeah, that's a tradition, tradition. So at home they're celebrating bonfire night, and obviously here they're celebrating, well, I don't know if anyone's going to be celebrating or commiserating um, the election. So yeah, we get to find out probably, well, I'm, I'm gonna stay up and watch it. So I'm gonna probably get myself a glass of wine and I'm going to edit this video. Um, and then hopefully overnight it will go up and then you'll have it tomorrow morning. But 
yeah that's basically it but I'm so sorry that I had no stitching that was completely not in my control at all it's just you know what happens and um yeah it just really really does anger the hell out of me that you know I've I've invested over five hundred thousand dollars into this country and he gave me a bloody hard time you know I had a really good application I had a business plan you know I've got building um, I've got an existing business already. I've got two years worth of tax returns. I've got W-2s. So I've got everything they could ever want. Yet the guy that sat in front of me hadn't even looked at my application. Yet he was making a decision on my whole entire life. And, you know, yet there's people coming over the border that are undocumented, that get free hotels, free health insurance, free money, free this, free everything else. And yet I come here legally and I get given a bloody hard time. And yes, it does grate on me and it does piss me off. So, um, you know, not getting political or anything, but yes, I do agree with Trump when he says, if you haven't come here legally, then I'm so sorry, you need to go out the country and you have to come back on a legal basis. I do feel really strongly about that because it, fair is fair, come on, do you know what I mean? Let's all be here on a legal basis, shall we? Um, and, I, and I, that goes for every single country. You know, England, we, we absolutely would, um, we're, we're happy to, to welcome in immigrants, but come on guys, just, you know, you've got to, you've got to add to the economy, you know, you've got to help, you've got to pay taxes and you've got to have a job and you can't just come into the country and expect the whole entire country to support you and your children and your family and give you free healthcare, free schools, free, ha free house and free everything else. So, you know, I, I am, I very much am a believer on like, you know, everyone should be, treated fairly and exactly the same and there is a, a huge parallel different like a massive monumental difference between those people that are treated fairly that do things legally and those people or unfairly and do things legally and those people that are treated like a completely different um and and aren't even here on a legal basis and honestly I get I got made to feel like a criminal when I was stood in front of that officer and he was like well I can't I can't um assume that you've not overstayed and I said to him so what are you looking at the moment are you looking at the customs and border protection um thing online and he said yeah I am I said but I've come and left the country how many times and there must have been 15 different entries and I said to him I have not overstayed one time I said if I was going to overstay I would have come in on the second time and just stayed you know or if I was going to overstay my visa I would not have got my change of status like they've already done their due diligence they would have known that already and I they just would have just they just would have absolutely denied my um change of status and you know you just get honestly I I got interrogated it wasn't for me it wasn't an interview it was an interrogation and it was bloody awful so yeah um but you know what I got to see my friends at home and that was really lovely I hadn't seen them for two years I got to go to pubs and eat my body weight in pork pies and fish and chips and Indians and um well I didn't eat Indian people but Indian um cuisine and um it was just oh it was, it was really lovely but in the back of my head I just constantly had that visa 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 you know what happens if what happens if what happens if and 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 I just could not really fully relax and and just really enjoy my time over there and and it's it really is sad but it completely spoiled my time and it's what is really sad is that I just hadn't seen anyone for two years and it was supposed to be like a really nice time and joyful and um happy time and it just really wasn't um it was difficult to try and be happy and and everything when I had such a worry in the back of my head about whether I was even going to get it back and then the other thing as well is once you get your visa back your visa does not give you access your visa allows you to travel into the country but whether you actually get into the country is the customs and border protection they decide even though you've um you know submitted I mean so my application went for, with 453 pages worth of supporting documentation so they've seen all that, they've made a decision on, they're happy with what you've got, what you've put in front of them, and they're happy at the interview because you've inter they've interviewed you as well. But then you still have to go through the gate master, you know, um, which is the people at Customs and Border Protection. And um, luckily, and I don't know what's happened, that there has been a massive shift in the way that they deal with you. Um, luckily, I literally went up to the guy and it was like, hey um 
and he, he took my passport and scanned it and he kind of looked at me and like went to my passport and went through the pages and he was like oh you're on an E2 um and I said yeah um he's like oh what's your business and I said oh it's a boarding uh, I said um he said, oh, he said where do you work and I said H for Equine LLC you know he was like I can see that ma'am what do you do <laughs> I was like oh so tired I'll just come off a plane do you know what I mean like give me a break <laughs> um I, oh, it was a person. Oh, do you know what? I swear I thought I just saw someone walk across my <laughs> my deck then, but I think it was a TV. Um, and I said, oh, no, I um, I own a boarding and, and therapy facility for horses. And he was like, oh, okay, cool, thanks. <laughs> Bang, bye. That was it. And I was just like, you know when you're like, hang on a minute. That was the easiest entry I've ever had in my life. He didn't stamp it. I said, do you, do you, I, you won't stamp my passport. And he went, everything's electronic now. And I said, oh, um, so my, my driver's license is expired and I need my I-94 in order to, um, it was like already done. It was already done. So I got in the car and cause obviously I, I didn't have a driver's license. My dad drove. And then the next day we went to get my driver's license. Um, so that was fine. Um, so I was, I was already on the customs and border protection, downloading my I-94 to make sure that he'd actually put me into the country correctly at the right time, at the right date, on an E2, because they do make mistakes. Um, and then I was able to take that documentation to the DSS in Georgia and um, and get my driver's license. So that was fine. But yeah, so that was it basically, guys. And I'm, I do apologize. I feel like I've shortchanged you a little bit with not having any stitching, but uh, I thought it was only fair to come up, come on with an update, because I've had people, honestly, it's so funny, like people going, come on. You know, it's time, time for an update. Like, where are you? I'm looking every single day for your updates. It's really quite funny. And do you know what? It's bloody lovely because, you know, you, you're not forgotten. And um, I've got people messaging me, PMing me, DMing me, um, just checking you okay. Did you get back okay? And it's just been lovely. So I thought, do you know what? I know I've got no stitching, but even if only two people watch the video, I've done it for those two people and, and, and I've updated my experience, my experience with the um, embassy and, and you know, what happened and, and what I did in, in the UK. So, um, yeah. So those two of you that are watching, <laughs> thank you so much. And, um, I promise you next month will be a different and I'm hoping by next month I'll have some, a bit more going on in the barn as well. So I think, uh, this is the last arena that Braxton's doing and then he's got a bit of, um, and then he's basically focusing on, on my, my my barn and we're gonna just get it up and done because luckily I have people smashing down my door saying I really want livery or boarding is, is over here um, are you open yet are you gonna be open for this time that time blah, blah blah I've got two geldings which is amazing so um I really want to get it open as quickly as possible so anyway thanks so much for watching guys and um I really appreciate your patience and I will see you in my next video bye